Okay, good evening and welcome to SRI. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> it's great to see new faces here tonight and also to see a lot of familiar faces and some SRI staff members. This is actually the beginning of our sixth year hosting um, the Science Cafe and we're really, really delighted to do so. Uh, if you haven't yet filled in a survey, we'd really appreciate it if you take a few minutes to do that. Uh, some of you were here uh, last month and uh, the feedback was really useful. So um, that would be great if you'd fill it in and then just drop it off at the table in the back um, for us. So now I put on my glasses so I can introduce tonight's terrific speaker, um, Joseph Rogers. Um, Joe joined SRI last year as executive director of our health sciences section. He directs research programs in addiction, brain imaging, sleep, and neurologic and metabolic diseases. Dr. Rogers has studied Alzheimer's disease for nearly four decades, and he discovered that inflammation can be an important factor in Alzheimer's, a finding that's now a mainstream area of investigation. Dr. Rogers founded Sun Health Research Institute in Arizona, which he built into an internationally recognized center for Alzheimer's research. And the institute is now one of 29 national Alzheimer's centers sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. He has more than 150 scientific publications and holds patents related to the diagnosis um, and treatment of Alzheimer's. And Dr. Rogers received his PhD from the University of California, San Diego, and he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Salk Institute. He was honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Alzheimer's Association. Now, I understand he is also a champion senior amateur golfer, and he says he's willing to play almost anyone except Tiger Woods in return for a major donation to SRI's Alzheimer's research. So with that, please welcome Dr. Joe Rogers. <clears throat> thank you for that. Well, thank you all very much for coming, and thank you for your interest in Alzheimer's disease. I think it's well that you have uh, an interest in finding out more about Alzheimer's, because America is growing older, you are growing older, and the worst thing that you can do for Alzheimer's disease is grow old. It is the leading risk factor that we have. Let me give you some statistics. About 20 years ago, Harvard Medical School sent out teams of neurologists and neuropsychologists out into the East Boston community. It's a sort of circumscribed community where you can literally go door to door, and that's what they did. They knocked on every door, and they asked if they could interview anyone in the household who was age 65 or more. Here's what they found. 10% of those they evaluated in East Boston had symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And that figure rose exponentially so that by age 85, 47% had symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Now, I've lived in that neck of the woods, uh, really cold there. And I have to say, I think that these statistics are somewhat exaggerated. They're biased by the fact that you have to be a little demented to live in East Boston in the first place. <laughs> Most everybody with good sense moved to California a long time ago, and this left all the dullards behind, and so we get this exaggerated statistic. Nonetheless, if we cut those numbers by a factor of five, say 2% of those age 65, and 10% of those age 85, those are still whopping numbers in an America where the number of people over age 60 will double in the next 60 years, and for the first time in our history, there will be more elderly people than children. So, biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, aging, getting old. Alzheimer's begins with something we're all familiar with, and that's forgetfulness. You want to see normal age-related forgetfulness in action? Go with me out in the parking lot after we're done and watch people walking around going, where did I park the damn car? Okay. This is normal. Take two aspirin and don't call me in the morning. This is absolutely normal. Uh, it, it, you've got a lot more on your mind and in your mind than you did when you were 17 years old. Think of your memory as a filing cabinet, and every memory is a file. Pretty soon, after about 67 years, I've gotten that filing cabinet really chock full of stuff. And so, to put another file, another memory into that filing cabinet gets really hard, and sorting through all of them that are there is even harder. So it is normal for you to get more forgetful as you get old. 
What we worry about is when you become pathologically forgetful in a way that keeps you from uh, functioning as an active, independent adult. That's the definition of dementia. A pathological forgetfulness that keeps you from being an active, independent adult. Okay. There, there's actually quite a lot of confusion about the terms that we use for Alzheimer's disease, dementia, uh, and forgetfulness. So let, let's do a little taxonomy here and I'll get on the same page. 20 years ago, when Uncle Joe was telling the same jokes to the same people every day, day after day, what did we say Uncle Joe was? We said he was senile, right? Now, that turns out to be not very useful and not very specific because Aunt Michelle, Uncle Joe's wife, she forgets to put her clothes on when she goes out for a walk. And we called her senile too. So we're covering way too much ground with this, this term. Um, in fact, uh, senile, the word senile derives from the Latin root senium. In Latin, senium means any number that is 60 or greater. So before you call somebody senile, you might want to check your birth certificate. I have been senile for the last seven years, and except for my wife, everybody thinks I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> if you are senile, that is, if you're in your senium and you are pathologically forgetful to the point that you can no longer function as an active, independent adult, you are said to have senile dementia. That is a big category. It's a category like this, and there are things underneath that cause it. Alzheimer's disease is one. In fact, when we have an opportunity to look at the brains of people who die with dementia, we find that about 80% of those who die with dementia had Alzheimer's disease. That was the cause. So Alzheimer's disease is one kind of dementia. Okay? But there are many other things that can cause dementia in an elderly person. Uh, Jakob Kreutzfeldt disease, for example, has many symptoms in common with Alzheimer's, is often misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's, but it, there is one important difference. It is transmissible, and it is universally fatal if it is transmitted. It's hard to transmit, fortunately, and it's fairly rare. This is very similar to mad cow disease, uh, but we have to watch out for it. We're very careful, for example, when handling Alzheimer's disease brain tissue uh, because there's just a chance it might be misdiagnosed Jakob Kreutzfeldt. Another thing that can cause uh, pathological forgetfulness in an elderly person is Wernicke Korsakoff. So it basically, uh, memory problems that co come from chronic alcoholism, and particularly in elderly people, you can get symptoms that look a lot like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, that, however, differs from Alzheimer's because it's treatable. You get the patient off the bottle, you give them some vitamin and nutritional supplementation, and some of their memory function will return, not all but they can regain function. That never happens in Alzheimer's disease. So who has Alzheimer's, or, or do, do you have Alzheimer's disease? Uh, that's probably first and foremost on your mind, and there's a good way to, to get, a, get past that. Uh, go see a good neurologist. You have some of the world's great neurologists just down the road at Stanford, and they are getting better and better at making the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Now, it is true that you cannot diagnose Alzheimer's disease with certainty except at autopsy. But in the last five or six years, we have developed new methods where we can actually image Alzheimer's disease pathology in the brain in a living person. And that, combined with very sensitive memory tests, have gotten us to the point where a good neurologist will be accurate in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's about 90 to 95 percent of the time. So if you're really worried, go find out. It's that easy. If you're too cheap to go to a good neurologist, I will give you my two five-second tests for whether or not you have Alzheimer's. The first is pretty simple, and it's based uh, purely on the fact that uh, most advanced Alzheimer's patients especially deny that there's anything wrong with them. They think there's something wrong with you because of the way you're treating them. Okay? Conversely, uh, People who, I find that people who are savvy enough to be worried that they have Alzheimer's disease are probably okay. So basically, first test, if you think you got Alzheimer's, you don't. And if you don't think you got Alzheimer's, you do. <laughs> second five-second uh, test comes from uh, one of the most common Alzheimer's memory tests, the MMSE. Uh, and I find it's a question that just seem, seems to be insightful with, with the kind of memory problems that Alzheimer's patients have. 
So here's a question. Now, you try to answer it in your head. Don't mumble it to your neighbor. Uh, you'll distract them. But here's a question. Just see how you do. Spell world backwards. Okay, now, I, I, I get a sort of sadistic pleasure out of asking that question because I can see a wave of horror sweep through the audience as people realize this is not as easy as I thought. Uh, it's D-L-R-O-W. I practice that. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, even if you've made a mistake or two, uh, Alzheimer's patients can't do it at all. They're absolutely clueless. So as long as you can spell world backwards or get, get your spouse to give you uh, another five-letter word. It has to be five letters. Four is too easy. Uh, and not six. That's too hard. Uh, five-letter word like train, that's another good one. Uh, and if you can spell that backwards, trust me, you're fine. Trust me, you're fine. So now we've established that you don't have Alzheimer's disease, but will you get it? Okay. Will you develop Alzheimer's disease? Let me see if I can do this. So there are a number of risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, uh, and I'm going to give you the, what I consider the most common, but there are some, some others that are uh, perhaps less salient. But as we discuss, the most salient risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is getting old. The older you get, the more likely it is that you will develop Alzheimer's. We're not sure actually why that is, but it is absolute certainty. I've never seen a teenager with Alzheimer's. Look, some of them look like it, but no. Uh, and conversely, um, almost everyone that has it, almost everyone, is old. Second risk factor is your genes. Aunt Mildred had Alzheimer's disease. Does that mean I'm going to get it? Uh, probably not. There is such a thing, however, as hereditary Alzheimer's disease. Fortunately, it's rare. Only about 3% of Alzheimer's cases are hereditary. But when it's hereditary, 50% of every generation will get it, generation after generation. That's the one difference with regular Alzheimer's. The other difference is they get it early. Average age of onset is 40 years old. I saw a young woman once who had the Alzheimer's mutation. She's 26, okay. So if you're worried about uh, your Aunt Mildred having Alzheimer's and it running in your family, here's a simple question. Did she get it when she was 70? Did she get it when she was 80? If yes, that's not hereditary Alzheimer's disease, almost certainly. If she got it in her 40s, you need to have yourself genotyped. You need to have a look at your genes to see if you have one of the three or four mutations that we know of uh, can cause Alzheimer's disease. And we know about them, we know where they are, we can do, run a test on you, and we can tell you if you have it and if you have it in your family. There are other factors besides overt mutations that cause disease. There are some other genes, uh, gene variants, that can influence the risk of the disease, but they don't necessarily directly cause disease. Um, these are somewhat complex. I can talk about them if you have questions, for example, about apolipoprotein E. If any of you can pronounce that enough to ask me a question about it, I'll be glad to answer. Third risk factor is inflammatory tone. There are 28 studies now that suggest that taking anti-inflammatory drugs before the period where you would normally be vulnerable to Alzheimer's disease protects you significantly from Alzheimer's disease. Now, there are a lot of caveats to that. Do not run out and buy a crate load of Advil and start taking it because you're going to end up with gastric, gastrointestinal problems that will probably kill you long before you would ever have gotten Alzheimer's disease. But uh, this is something that I discovered uh, back in the 1980s, that inflammation does occur in the Alzheimer's disease brain uh, and, and is a major contributor to the damage that's done to the brain in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and there is some precedent, as I said, for um, changes in inflammatory tone to, to be uh, predictive of Alzheimer's disease. If you've got arthritis, uh, it actually may cut both ways. Is that a, oh, <laughs> okay. It, 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 arthritis actually seems to cut both ways. You would think, well, your inflammatory tone is increasing in, uh, in arthritis, so you might be more at risk. Actually, I did a study about 12 years ago where we surveyed 5,000 people with arthritis and 5,000 people who had other diagnoses uh, that were the same age. 
And we found out actually that people with arthritis were significantly less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Now, I think what that means is not that arthritis somehow protects you from Alzheimer's. What I think it says is the drugs that you are taking for your arthritis are protecting you. But once again, big caveat, you, you want to keep your stomach intact, really, do not mess with these drugs without uh, a good, good reason to do so. Head trauma is another major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, especially repeated head trauma. We used to have a name for this. It was called dementia pugilistica, the dementia of boxers. We now know that, in fact, this is Alzheimer's disease, uh, and it's common to a lot of folks who have repeated head trauma in their lives, NFL football players in particular. There's a lot of press these days about football players having a higher than chance uh, or higher than expected likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease, and that's a true fact. Um, nonetheless, the fact that you've had a severe concussion or severe head trauma doesn't necessarily mean you're going to develop Alzheimer's disease. It just means that your risk has gone up somewhat. Here's a really important one, I think, uh, and most people aren't aware of. Um, what's the organ in your body that needs blood better more than any other organ in your body? This one, not your heart. It's this one right here, much more than your heart. Um, so uh, there's a lot of research has been done, and it turns out that the, the vascular supply to the brain is, in, by many accounts, very much compromised in Alzheimer's disease. Let me show you an example. This is from a study my colleague uh, Alex Rohr did at my previous institution. What you see here are 12 blood vessels that Dr. Rohr cut out at autopsy from from 12 different normal elderly people, okay? And to be fair, to do it right, all of these pieces of blood vessel came from exactly the same place in each patient. It's where the middle cerebral artery branches off from the circle of Willis. You don't need to know that. Just know every one of those blood vessels was taken at exactly the same place in all those 12 different patients. Those are pretty good looking blood vessels. Uh, you can see a little bit of that yellowish sort of stuff on the inside of the vessel. That's plaque. Uh, but I would be really happy to have those blood vessels in my brain, okay, at this point in my life. Contrast that with 12 Alzheimer's disease patients that he sampled. Same place, exactly the same place. I don't think you have to be a neuroscientist or a rocket scientist to see that there is a significant problem there and it, that it would be a really good idea to keep your blood vessels uh, free of, of this kind of damage. Uh, so do it for your heart. Do it for your brain. It's the same thing. Uh, get your cholesterol down, exercise, flush that plaque out as best you can. Uh, you'll be doing something good to protect yourself from Alzheimer's disease. Lastly, we have intellectual state, uh, intellectual vigor. Uh, this is everybody's favorite uh, risk or anti-risk factor. Uh, so many people out there are saying, um, you know, Read the Bible, read War and Peace, uh, do the New York Times crossword puzzle, keep mentally active. Uh, I am in a distinct minority, but I think that's hogwash. Okay? Everything that you do with your brain, now the simplest thing, wiggling this finger, looking over here and seeing that speaker, the, the huge, massive numbers of nerve cells in my brain are firing, all coordinated. Uh, your brain is mentally active doing the stupidest thing as imaginable. You, you, and I would defy virtually anyone using any brain imaging technique or any other technique known, recording directly from your brain, to, to tell me when somebody is reading War and Peace and when somebody is reading Mad Magazine, okay? You just can't tell. Your brain is mentally active it, it, from the time you're awake. So I don't agree with it on, on scientific grounds, but I will tell you, ver almost all scientists in Alzheimer's disease do. I mean, it's, a, it's easy to be popular. I mean, you can pat yourself on the back. I don't have Alzheimer's disease. I must have been intellectually vigorous, and, and so I've protected myself. That's, that's very palatable. It makes you feel good. What I really don't like is the flip side. So what this actually says is that people with Alzheimer's disease deserve it. They, they, they were intellectual couch potatoes. Uncle Joe sat on his couch watching Jeopardy, uh, and his brain atrophied, and he developed Alzheimer's disease. That's just not right. That's, that is confusing cause with effect. Uncle Joe was developing Alzheimer's disease, could not make much sense of the world, and was uncomfortable in the world, and so he retreated back to his couch. 
That makes sense to me. These people did not deserve Alzheimer's disease. And there, many of them are among the most intellectually vigorous people in life imaginable. Um, you can see here, too, what a democratic disease this is. I mean, you've got people of all stations. You can also see it's a very Republican disease, too. Barry Goldwater and, <laughs> and, uh, and President Reagan. I, I saw President Reagan, actually, when I was uh, in my teens back when he was doing GE Theater, some of you probably remember that, and he went around the country sponsored by GE giving talks about government, and he was very, very impressive and knowledgeable. Uh, I think he was less so at the very end of his presidency, and I don't think it was his fault. I think it just simply had to do with the fact that he didn't think as well anymore. So these folks didn't deserve Alzheimer's disease, and I don't agree with that particular theory. There was something on the... In, uh, on, uh, the uh, NPR station, the public PBS station, uh, a good friend and colleague uh, at uh, Harvard, Randy, Rudy Tonzi, uh, is putting out something called mindfulness as a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. I got a lot of time for Rudy. He is a really smart guy, also an incredibly good pianist. Uh, and I somewhat agree with his take. I mean, Rudy just says, not necessarily that this is going to protect you from Alzheimer's disease, but he says, pay attention, be mindful. Okay. That, I think, would delay the expression of symptoms because, you know, basically, if you don't pay attention, you're not going to remember something. If you never noticed it to begin with, you're not going to remember it. So if you train yourself to be more attentive, I think you will improve your memory, and I think in, that, in some sense that might push the time that you start really showing big-time symptoms of Alzheimer's uh, further away. 